What the heck is going on? All right. Well, looks like we had a little technical difficulty, but we're on the air and welcome to in the free zone, everyone. Uh, we're going to talk, going to talk about district standings this week. It is week six and, uh, in three, two, one, a, in the two, eight man divisions, the districts are starting to take shape. Everybody's got at least two district games under their belt now. And so I just wanted to kind of real quickly kind of buzz through the district standings. Um, obviously there's still three district games to go in each of these. And so none of these are decided. So that's what we're going to take a look at after that. If we've got time, we'll talk a little coaching philosophy and we'll take a look at the matchups that we've got coming up this week. Uh, what's up, Derek? Not a whole lot, man. I think we had too many producers working that first part of the show. Yeah. Something, something was going on there, but that's okay. <laughs> Yeah. All right, we're gonna we're gonna start in our smallest division. That is eight man division two. There are eight districts in eight man division two. Thirty two teams make the playoffs. That means four teams out of each district will make the playoffs. And we'll start in the west. Saint Francis is two and zero. Oh. Wheatland Grinnell is two and zero. Oh. Next in the district is Logan Palco and Tri Plains Brewster, both at one and one. And Quinter and Sharon Springs, Wallace County are at 0 and 2. So those are your your favorites in the district. Looks like right now St. Francis and Wheatland Grinnell are sitting pretty good. Uh, eight man two district seven is not quite as decided. There's only one undefeated team in the district, and that is South Central. Uh, by the way, South Central is only three and two overall, but they're two and zero in the district. South Central's got Mineola at one and one, Buckland at one and one, Ingalls at one and one, Dighton and Satanta in that district. So South Central, who has already beaten Mineola and Buckland, is kind of sitting pretty in that district. They are they're in the driver's seat in that district. Um, district six, eight man two. Caldwell is three and one. Obviously, this district's been playing more district games than some of the others. Caldwell is at three and one. South Barber's at three and one. Norwich at two and one. Hutch Central Christian at two and two. Stafford one and two. Peabody Burns one and two. And South Haven is 0 and three in the district. So Caldwell and South Barber definitely looking like maybe the favorites. Norwich is definitely there in the running too. All right, eight man two, district five. We've got Victoria at three and oh, Wilson at three and oh, Central Plains at two and one, Sylvan Lucas at two and one. So those four teams are definitely looking strong in district five. Tescott's oh and two, Otis Bison is one and three, and Chase is oh and four. Eight man two, district four. We've got Thunder Ridge at three and one, Lakeside Downs at three and one, Beloit St. John's Tipton at three and one. So that's a pretty good race at the top of that district. Osborne at two and one. Those would be the four teams that right now would advance if, if the playoffs were tomorrow. Pike Valley at one and two, Mankato Rock Hills at 0 oh and three, and Southern Cloud at 0 oh and three. Eight man two district three Frankfurt four and zero oh. Hanover is two and zero oh. Lynn is zero oh and zero oh. Lynn has not played any games and I don't believe Lynn is playing this year they have they're the only team that's been eliminated in that district uh, Blue Valley Randolph zero oh and one Wetmore zero oh and one Axtell zero oh and two and Onaga zero oh and two and now in, in district three we're getting up more into the northern and eastern part of the state and so. Uh, there are some of those schools that have not played as many games. Some of those schools had delayed starts and some of them like Jayhawk Lynn, not playing at all. All right. Uh, in eight man two district two, we have Lebo at two and O oh, Meredith Valley at two and O oh, Hartford at one and one rural Vista at one and one center lost Springs. zero oh and two and Wakefield. zero oh and two. Remember, four teams are going to make the playoffs out of that district. So Lebo, Meredith Valley, Hartford, and Rural Vista look like the favorites right now out of that. And the last district, eight man two, district one, Colony Crest is two and oh, Chautopa is two and oh, Waverly one and one, St. Paul one and one, Southern Coffee is oh and two, and Altoona Midway is oh and two. All right, let's take a look at Derek. You want to make any comments about eight man two? 
<laughs> I well, honestly, man, I've never seen an eight man game. Yeah. And I grew up by Rala, and yeah. I think Yarbrough was even doing eight man for a while there when I was going to high school. But I, I would, I we've been talking about it for six weeks now, and I really want to watch a game. Yeah, eight man's a great game to watch. It really is. But I knew that. Yeah, I knew there weren't many of those teams that you'd be familiar with. And to be honest with you, there aren't many of them left in Southwest Kansas. A lot of those schools in Southwest Kansas, you know, Rala, um, Moscow. Um, Several of those there have dropped to six man, and some of them have also, you know, consolidated with other schools, their football programs. So, yeah, I, I knew that a lot of those would not be very familiar to you. Yeah. All right. We'll quickly go through eight man one here. See, and we'll start in district one. Cedarvale Dexter is two and oh, Sedan is two and oh, Oswego's one and one, West Elk is one and one, Yates Center is zero oh and two, and Marmoton Valley is zero oh and two. So again, the four that right now are, are in the lead are Cedarvale, Dexter, Sedan, Oswego, and West Elk. District two, Madison is two and zero. Chase County's two and zero. Central Burden one and one. Oxford one and one. Flint Hills is zero and two, and Udall is zero and two. District three, we have Clifton Clyde, the Eagles at two and zero. Washington County at one and one. Donovan West at one and one. Valley Falls at one and one. Burlingame at one and one and Maranatha Academy at 0 and 2. Okay, so that one could have a pretty interesting race there. District 4, Canton Galva, 2 and 0, 5 and 0 overall. Solomon, 1 and 1. Little River, 1 and 1. Lincoln, 1 and 1. Bennington, 1 and 1. And Harrington is 0 and 2. So again, a pretty competitive race in District 4 for the four playoff positions. In eight man one district five, we have Argonia Attica, two and oh, five and oh overall, definitely the favorite in the district. Medicine Lodge is at one and one, Pretty Prairie is at one and one, Mound Ridge is at one and one, Gossel at one and one, and Fairfield at oh and two. Eight man district, eight man one district six, we have Pratt Skyline at two and oh. They're five and oh overall, definitely in the driver's seat. Lacrosse is two and oh. Kiowa County, that would be Greensburg, is one and one. Kinsley, one and one. St. John, oh and two. And Maxville, oh and two. Another of the favorites in the state we'll find in District 7, Leota, Wichita County, 2 0 in the district, 5 0 overall. But also in that same district, South Gray, 2 0 in the district, and 5 0 overall. So that should be a heck of a game when those two play. And I don't think that's this week. No, it is not this week. However, Mead, who is 2 1 and 0 and 1 in the district, that's who's got Leota this week. Okay, so that ought to be a good game, too. Uh, Spearville is 0-1, Meade is 0-1, and, and Nest City is 0-2 in the district. And again, four teams will advance to the playoffs. And District 8, Hill City is 1-0, Hoxie's 1-0, Atwood Rollins County is 0-0, Wakini Trigo County is 0-0, and Oberlin Decatur County 0-1, Stockton 0-1. Now, by the way, Atwood Rollins County and Joaquini Trigo, they have both played games. They just haven't played a district game yet. So they are both playing, okay? Um, and that's eight-man division one. Quick look at 1A. First of all, the good news. I tell you what, since, since you're from Elkhart, Derek, I'm going to lay the good news and the bad news for Elkhart on you. The bad news is Elkhart's one and four. The good news is they're going to make the playoffs. Really? Yeah. Because there are 28 or 29 teams in 1A, and it's a 32-team bracket. So everybody's <laughs> making the playoffs. <laughs> and, and at least three teams, either three or four teams, are getting a first round bye. <laughs> are they having a tough year because of a schedule, or are they just having like a rebuilding year? I think it's it, it's probably just a little bit of both. They were definitely going to have a rebuilding year this year, no matter what. But then the way the district is structured, they've got Conway Springs and Sedgwick. Those are a couple of really tough programs that are in their district. So, you know, trade those two out for a couple of uh, of different teams and they might be, you know, they might be, you know, 
two and three instead of one and four or, or something like that. You know, and I think Elkhart's going to win another couple of games. I think they'll win this week against Stanton County. Um, they've already beaten Wichita independent. Let's see. No, they lost. Ah, let me double check that. They lost to Wichita independent. They've got Stanton County left Sedgwick and Whitewater Remington. It's going to be a tough road to hoe for the Wildcats. They're going to, they, they ought to get a win against Stanton County, but they're going to have to play hard to beat either Sedgwick or uh, Whitewater Remington. I think. So, I got kind of an off topic question, but I've been wondering yeah. about this whole show. So have you, has there ever been a situation where like, you know, since we we're talking, talking about eight man, have you, has there ever been a situation where schools were so small and had so like so few players turn out that schools combined it and formed a team or is that like a yeah. game for rules? Okay. No, uh, uh, that's, that, that's perfectly legal. A lot of schools do that. As a matter of fact, some of those schools that I was giving you where there was more than one name, that's because it's more than one school play. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So like Axtell Byrne, they used to play together. Lucas Larray, they used to play together. Okay. Some of these schools too, that only have one name now are consolidated schools like Central Plains. Okay. Is Claflin and other schools that are consolidated, you know, uh, and, and so some of these are consolidated schools too, but yeah, there, there are definitely schools that will band together for a football program. Yes. That's awesome. And as a matter of fact, that's how you end up. Number one, you have less schools playing football now than you did at one time because some of those smallest schools have dropped football. But you also end up with less schools in the brackets, which is what caused reclassification here a couple of years ago because some of those schools are combining programs. Yeah. So, yeah, that certainly happens. Okay, so in... In, in 1A, everybody's going to make the playoffs, okay? So it doesn't really matter a whole lot, but we'll quickly run through. There are four districts. There are seven teams in each district, it looks like. Yeah. Okay, so district, we'll start with District 4 out here to the west. Conway Springs is 3-0. and Sedgwick is 2-0 and in the district, okay? Conway Springs actually 4-1 and overall. Sedgwick's 5-0 and overall. Whitewater Remington is two and one in the district, two and three overall. Sublette, one and one in the district. Elkhart, one and two in the district. Wichita Independent, one and three in the district. And Stanton County is 0 and three. Uh, district three, Inman, four and oh, four and one overall. Smith Center, three and oh, four and one overall. Oakley's two and two. Smith Center just beat Oakley last week, so that puts Smith Center kind of in, in the driver's seat there. Uh, Plainville, one and two. El Saline, one and two. Sacred Heart, one and three. And Ellenwood is 0 and three. In 1A District 2, we have Centralia at 4 and 0. Centralia is traditionally a very strong program. Valley Heights, three and one. Jackson Heights, two and one. Wabunsee, one and two. Jeffco North, one and two. Horton 0 and 2 and Troy 0 and 3. And in District 1, Olpe, also always a favorite for the state championship most years, is at 4 and 0. Linden, another traditionally strong program, is at 2 and 1, 4 and 1 overall. Uniontown 2 and 1, Central Heights 1 and 1, Northeast Arma 0 and 1, Northern Heights 1 and 3 and Pleasanton 0 and 3. All right. Uh whoa. Let's take a quick look at 2A. Now, in 2A, we have eight districts. The top four teams will make the playoffs out of each district. And we'll start off in the east, District 1. Riverton is 2-0. St. Mary's Colgan is 1-0. That's Pittsburgh. Southeast Cherokee is 1-0. Fredonia, 1-1. Erie, 0-2. And Neodiche is 0-2. District 2, Osage City 2 and 0, Wellsville 1 and 0, Eureka 1 and 1, West Franklin 1 and 1, Jayhawk Lynn 0 and 1, and Humboldt 0 and 2. In District 3, Rossville 2 and 0, Silver Lake 2 and 0, Mission Valley 1 and 1, Pleasant Ridge 1 and 1. So there are your top 4 teams. McLeod is at 0 and 2 and Oskaloosa is at 0 and 2. Uh, District 4, 
and this team will not be playing this week. I noticed that Nemaha Central is looking for another opponent. So this week was supposed to be a matchup of the two top teams in this district in uh, Moore Hill Mount Academy and Nemaha Central. Moore Hill had to cancel that game because of COVID problems. So right now, though, Moore Hill Mount Academy is 2-0, and Nemaha Central 2-0. and Republic County 1 and 1, Riverside 1 and 1, St. Mary's 0 and 2, and Atchison County is 0 and 2. In District 5, Hutch Trinity is 2 and 0, 5 and 0 overall. Hillsboro is 2 and 0, 3 and 2 overall. Sterling 1 and 1, Haven 1 and 1. Those are your top 4 teams, and the last two are Lions at 0 and 2 and Marion at 0 and 2. 2A District 6 Top four teams, Garden Plain at 2-0, Kingman at 2-0, Bell Plain at 1-1, Chaparral at 1-1. Douglas is 0-2, and, and Leon Bluestem is 0-2. District 7, and this, this is a, a district that's had some pretty good matchups in it and still will. Cimarron at 2-0, Thomas Moore Prep at 2-0, Lakin at 2-0. Ellis at 0-2, Syracuse at 0-2, and, and Southwestern Heights at 0-2. And again, four teams will advance to the playoffs. And the last district, District 8 in Class 2A, we've got Hoisington at 2-0, Beloit at 1-1, Minneapolis at 1-1, Phillipsburg at 1-1, Ellsworth at 1-1, and Norton at 0-2. Norton's 3-3 overall, but 0-2 in the district. Um, my, I, I'm guessing... Norton's probably going to bounce back and challenge for the playoffs in that district, but I don't know. That's a pretty tough district. Yeah. So good luck to good luck to the Blue Jays there. All right, let's take a quick look at 3A. Seth Luan had a question for you. But oh, yeah. Is Pittsburgh Colgan still relevant? Yes, Seth, they certainly are. Uh, they, uh, you know, they're one of those teams that they often challenge for state championships. Um, they may be, hmm, you know, I, I'm this year they're doing good. I'm not entirely sure how they did last year. If I remember right, I think Eric Simmons' kid plays for him. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's got a he's got a son that's playing for. If they are not playing this year, they played for him last year. But I don't think he graduated last year. I think Eric Simmons has got a son that still plays for Colgan. Yeah, Colgan's tough. They're always tough. They're always right there in the in the running in the district and in the state. Last year, it seems like they may have been down a little. I might be wrong though. We're trusting my memory, and I'm getting old, so I'm not entirely sure of that. But anyway, yeah, they're in good shape this year too. And I'm just um, going to throw this out there sometime in the future. Uh, Seth needs to come co-host this show. Absolutely. That would be way great. better than me. I feel like I'm just sitting here. But, but Norm's, I would, a, Norm's a smart one. <laughs> I, I would love to have Seth co-host the show sometime. Be great. <laughs> All right. So that's it. 3-2-1-A in the two eight-man divisions. 4-5 and 6-A, everybody makes the playoffs. We'll talk about seeding as we get a little closer to the playoffs. Um so that was, I just wanted to take that quick review of who, who looks like they're going to make the playoffs and, and who looks like they've got some work to do if they're going to get there. Um, some of our local schools are sitting in good shape for the playoffs and we wish them the best, you know, but that's all I really wanted to take a look at as far as the playoffs go. So let's take a quick look at this week's match matchups in the GWAC, the WAC, the High Plains League and the Southern Plains Iroquois League. And then, uh, I think we'll have time to talk a little offensive philosophy. Then I'll ask you some questions, Derek. That'll give you more of a chance to talk. (laughs) Okay, here we go. Here are this week's matchups. And remember, uh, we're all into for 3-2-1-A and the two eight-man divisions. They're all into districts, okay? So uh, that's what affects a lot of this, okay? So they're not playing many conference games anymore. They're playing district games. Okay, so we've got four and one Russell versus or four and one Colby, excuse me, versus zero and five Russell in what ought to be the game of the one of the games of the week in the state and in our area. Five and zero Holcomb versus five and zero Cheney, and that is in all in all likelihood for the district championship. Okay, um, we've got two and three Goodland at five and zero southeast of Celine, three and two Scott City versus two and three Smoky Valley, 
three and two Cimarron versus three and two Lakin. The winner of that game won't clinch the district championship, but they'll they'll be a, a you know have kind of the inside track to it. Two and three Ulysses versus one and four Wellington. In the WAC, we have Hayes versus Dodge City. Hayes is four and zero. Oh, Dodge City's two and three. We have Garden City one and four versus Cape and Mount Carmel three and one, and we've got one and four Liberal at zero oh and four Great Bend. In the High Plains League, we've got three and two Syracuse versus one and four Ellis. Of course, Lakin has Cimarron. Southwestern Heights one and four versus four and one TMP. One and two Sublette versus four and one Conway Springs, and one and four Elkhart versus zero oh and five Stanton County. In the Southern Plains Iroquois Association, we've got 5-0 and South Gray at 4-1 and Spearville. That ought to be a heck of a game. We've got 4-1 and Hodgman at 1-3 and Nest City. Another one that ought to be a good game here, we've got 2-1 and Mead at 5-0 and Leota. We've got 3-2 and South Central at 1-2 and Dighton. 2-3 and Buckland at 2-3 and Maniola. 0-3 oh, Satanta at 1-4 and four Ingalls and 1-4 and four Kiowa County at 5-0 and oh Pratt Skyline. Um, so those are all, you know, those are the matchups right in our area, the leagues right in our area, and those are the ones that, that those are the games that I pick every week or the games from those leagues. Um, you know, there's some good matchups in there. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens in, in that Holcomb Cheney game. Um, Hayes Dodge City, that's an important game for the WAC and WAC standings. Um, Liberal Great Bend, even though neither of the teams have a great record, it ought to be a good matchup. Yeah. You know, having watched Great Bend on film, uh, I think you're going to have two fairly similar teams playing in that game. And of course, uh, Lakin and Cimarron, there's a big matchup from the High Plains League in the GWAC there. And South Gray Spearville and Mead Leota, those all ought to be good games, hopefully. Um, I was going to ask you, and this might be uh, one of the secrets that might, you know, you don't want to know how the sausage is made all the time, but what, say, like, aside from bragging rights, what what does it do for your school to go far in this in this uh, contest of football? Like, say if you go all the way to state, is there like a benefit for your school other than the the trophy? Um, I, it it really it really depends. Um, in a lot of states and in a lot of more populous parts of this state. Having a good football team can actually do a lot for your enrollment. <laughs> Believe it or not, people will transfer their kids into schools that have, I mean, there are a lot of different reasons. It's not just football, okay? But some people will transfer their kids into a school because it has a good football team. Some people will transfer their kids into a school because it has good facilities, you know, or maybe it, you know maybe their their kids wanting to go into into band and they have a good band you know i mean it whatever it is and so yeah there is some some effect there that effect becomes much more pronounced in some other states i know in texas a lot of schools feel like the key to to uh you know to boosting their not just to boosting their enrollment but to boosting the town's population and the economy of a town they feel like is often tied to, to good high school football teams, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, th th so there's that advantage. Now there's also some advantages for individual players on the teams too. Um, you're more likely to get some exposure. You're more likely to be recruited from a winning program or from a winning team than you are, you know, obviously winning teams and winning programs are more likely to catch the attention of college coaches. So you're more likely to get recruited. That's one personal benefit. Mm -hmm. But now as far as a financial benefit, it, this is not pro ball, you know, this is high school ball. So in the state of Kansas, no, there is, there's not any real financial benefit. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, basically when it comes to the playoff games, that's how Keisha makes their money. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to playoff games, you know, they don't honor any passes, any of that kind of thing. Well, the reason for that is because Keisha is going to take the gate. They're going to give the host school 
back what it costs them to run the game. You know, in other words, what it takes to pay the officials, to pay the ticket takers and that kind of stuff. Okay. And I think there is actually some small percentage that the, that the host team takes. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but for the most part, that money goes to Keisha. And that's part of how the state activities association operates is off of the gate revenues from the football playoffs, the basketball tournaments, the soccer tournaments, the, the track, uh, the state track meet, the, the baseball and softball tournaments, all that postseason stuff, mm. that all, that money all goes to the state activities association and that's where their operating budget comes from. So no, there's no real financial incentive to, to schools to, to make it into the playoffs or to make a deep run in the playoffs. It's just a, it's community pride more than anything, you know? Well, when you interviewed Craig Friedendahl, he said something that I thought was pretty uh, interesting is that like, he, he basically said that if he wanted to be taken seriously in like MLB status, he had to basically not leave Elkhart, but basically almost pay to play. Like, so, you, you know, you hear about these students transferring to another school. It's, it's kind of, I, is, is it like pretty difficult to, if even if talent, no matter how much talent you have, is it, is it a lot harder to, to make a career for yourself if you're in a no name town playing like eight man football or. It, it is harder. Yes. It's yeah. harder to get noticed. It's harder to get recruited. It's not impossible by any means, though, okay? Yeah. There have been plenty of good high school, good Kansas kids that have come out of, you know, small programs in small towns, you know, um, and, and not just in Kansas. You know, Rashawn Salam, he won the uh, – he won the Heisman. I don't remember what year it was off the top of my head, but Rashawn Salam played eight man ball in high school. Okay. Now, granted, he played it like uh, I don't know. He played it in a in a high school in California that was probably in a pretty good sized town. Yeah. He played at Sunny Day, you know, which uh, is and and I'm sure it's a small school, but it's a small small uh, religious school. Yeah, there we go. Seth says it was ninety four. Okay. So I, I don't know much about Sunny Day High School, but I'm sure it's nothing like Rolla High School. Okay. Yeah. Um, Seth but, said, when you were talking earlier, he said the Dallas suburbs are a good example. Yeah, exactly. A good example of people coming to town because of a winning football program. Absolutely. Not only that, but facilities too. They build those nice football fields because people like to, you know, like to come watch in a nice facility and, you know. And that, that's how they justify it down in Texas. So yeah, there, that certainly goes on there. And I'm sure there are plenty of other states too, but Texas is the best example that pops into my mind. So yeah, all those things happen. Now, you know, back to, back to recruiting, there have been plenty of kids that have gotten recruited out of small schools in Kansas, but it is harder. It's harder to get noticed. You know, one thing that has leveled the playing field, maybe a little bit in recent years days is, and, and there are other things that have probably skewed it the other way too, but it used to be like, say, you know, 30 some years ago when I was playing in high school, you still use 16 millimeter film. So you didn't send a lot of film out to, to college coaches, right? Mm -hmm. College coaches still a lot of times had to come to games in person at, to watch players and to recruit players. And that was both a good thing and a bad thing because you got to see college coaches face to face a lot more, but obviously they can only be in one place at a time, you know, and so they didn't get out and recruit nearly the volume that they can today. Today you have huddle and, and these other systems and they're, they're all online, they're internet based, a college coach can access them from anywhere. They don't even have to ask a coach to send them film. Chances are the highlights are already posted on the team's site or the kids are posting their highlight films on social media or whatever. Kids are sending their highlight films to college coaches, you know, I mean, so, so film is much more accessible to college coaches now than it's ever been. And it's, and, and that makes the recruiting probably, you know, that probably evens the, the playing field a little bit when it comes to recruiting for, for kids that are kind of from the middle of nowhere, but it is still harder. Yeah. For, for kids from, from, uh, you know, places like Elkhart and Hugoton and places like that, it's still harder for them to get noticed than it is kids from Kansas city or Wichita yeah. or, or wherever, you know, there's no doubt about that, but you know, you're never going to completely level the playing field. You know, there's, 
it's just kind of kind of the nature of life you know it doesn't matter whether we're talking about recruiting or whatever there are advantages and disadvantages to everywhere you live to every situation you find yourself in and so on you know yeah um so you know it's it's neither here nor there but it is a little harder yeah for a kid to get recruited sometimes out here in the middle of nowhere one thing though that kansas kids used to have going for them was the fact that there were so many JUCOs in Kansas, okay? Mm -hmm. And those JUCOs used to offer Kansas kids a lot of opportunities. Unfortunately, those JUCOs used to be limited in how many out-of-state players they could have on scholarship. And a bunch of those now have done away with that. And the unfortunate result of that, that me as a high school coach and a lot of other high school coaches in the state that it pisses us off is those, a lot of those schools just quit looking at in-state kids, you know, which is ridiculous, you know? And I don't know if this is like a, cause I, when I was living in garden city, I met a lot of uh, players that they were, they were there to play football and they were not from Kansas. You know, they were from all over the country. A lot of people right. from Florida, a lot of people from the South, yeah. And the, the, the one common denominator whenever, because I'm a natural interviewer, when I talk to people at parties, I interview them. Mm -hmm. and one of the common denominators I found with all those guys that played uh, football at the college there is that they were really good at football and really not great at school. And that was like, is that like, do they send them to yeah. places like to JUCOs to work on their grades and be a part of a decent football program at the same time? Or Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what happens. So JUCOs have a completely different standard for eligibility, initial eligibility, than NCAA Division One institutions do. Each division has different standards, okay? And... Back in the days when I was a kid, what they had was something that they called Prop 48, which meant if you, were, if you weren't going to qualify academically, that school could kind of set you up with another school, you know, and they'd watch your, well, they, they can't quite do that these days, but it's still pretty close to that. Okay. So a lot of those kids that know that academically they're going to have problems with their initial eligibility, either because they haven't taken the right classes or they don't have a high enough GPA or they haven't passed enough core classes or whatever it is. There's a thing called the NCAA clearinghouse that you have to go through. Okay. And so if they know they're not going to pass the NCAA clearinghouse for one reason or another, a lot of those kids, if they're really good athletes, will go the JUCO route. And they know that they can go put in a year or two at a JUCO. And if they do well at the JUCO, keep their grades up, then they're going to be able to transfer to a, to a NCAA program and they'll, they'll be able to transfer in eligible. And, and so, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of your JUCO players go that route. And that's why among college coaches, sometimes the, the teams that build their rosters by recruiting the JUCOs, those schools kind of, you know, it, that kind of gets uh, other schools kind of look down their nose at that because they, that's why, is because they see them as basically picking up a bunch of kids that otherwise would be academic non-qualifiers. To me, that's another one of those ridiculous things. You know, kids make mistakes. Kids uh, sometimes don't take don't take school as seriously as they should. The JUCOs give them a chance to redeem themselves, you know, and, and a lot of those kids then, like I said, if they're really good football players, chances are they'll get a shot to go on to the next level from the JUCO. You keep and, using the word kid, and I know that, you know, they, <laughs> you're talking about college kids, but still, yeah. like, sometimes I'm like, I get the whole not great at the scholastic <laughs> part of it because, you know, a lot of times they're doing like practice early in the morning. They're doing school all day, practice at late. Cause I would, when I, I used to deliver pizzas in garden, garden city and they, they made the practice fields across the street from on a uh, campus, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is like, I'm, I was like, when am I going to run over a football player? Cause it was just, they were just, always had to <laughs> walk this huge road, but they would, practice until dark like it was late at night there's a reason yeah. they put lights up at those practice fields you know and oh, then yeah. some of them not all of them but some of them had to do jobs you know to help pay mm -hmm. for school so yeah. like i i get it like so let me ask you this because I, I was somebody that struggled in high school you taught me mm -hmm. what, what what kind of safeguard do you guys have for athletes now like because you have somebody that kills on the field but they're just not picking it up in the classroom because I, I when i was like in the eighth grade I just got told, well, you're not eligible this week, but there wasn't really a lot of help given to me in the eighth grade. Right. All right. So, you know, every school does things differently. Okay. But uh, all I can tell you is what we do at Liberal right now. Okay. So at Liberal right now, we have weekly eligibility. Mm 
And the first time that you're not, and our, our weekly eligibility is the same as the state's eligibility standard, which is you have to be passing five classes. Okay. So let's say week, week four runs around and we've got a student that's only passing four classes. Um, and, and we have variable enrollment now too, under our new schedule. So the problem is you may have a kid that's only in, you know, six classes. Well, if he's only in six classes, he's got to pass all but one of them, you know, or he might only be in five classes. So the first thing is we encourage our students to take seven classes every semester. Okay. If they're athletes. Okay. So let's say the first eligibility report runs around. We've got a kid that's only passing four classes. Two things are going to happen. Number one, he's going to be put on probation. He's not going to be automatically ineligible. He gets one week of probation to get his, to get his grades up. Number two, we have, and most teams at, at Liberal High School, and I'm sure at other schools, we have uh, we have tutoring, you know. And so if we have a kid that's down, we're going to get him into right now because we're in remote learning more or less at Liberal High School. That means they come into a thing that we call the Internet Cafe. And that is a place where we have lots of uh, lots of Wi-Fi access for our kids. It's in the gym of one of the schools. We got tables set up in there. We can, even with social distance, we can fit, I don't know, 70 or 80 kids in there, maybe more than that. And we have teachers in there and we have paras in there to, to, to help those kids. Right. Mm -hmm. And so right now our kids, if they're, if they're down in a few classes, they're rather than sitting at home on, you know, because they're only in schools for six hours a week right now. Yeah. Well, well, right now, those other hours of the week, then if your grades are down and you're on the football team, you're going to be in the internet cafe instead of sitting at home. Yeah. And there are going to be tutors helping you with your work. Um, other, other years when we've had more normal school and more normal schedule, we have a program called later at LHS, which is an after school program. And we send those kids to that after school program, you know, um, used to be that they did later at LHS in the evenings. Like one of the sessions was like seven to nine in the evenings. And that was great for those kids. But if we don't have that available, then, you know, all of the coaches, we're all teachers, we'll bring the kids in there and there have been years that we would just have them in there in the locker room and they'd all take out their laptops and all the kids that are working on math would get over there with coach Z and kids that needed English help would be with me and so on, you know? So we do everything we can to try to help those kids Yeah. because, you know, the main thing in high school, the vast majority of our kids are not going to go on to play football anywhere else, even at a, even at a junior college. The vast majority of our kids, though, need a high school diploma because they need to be able to to have a future. Yeah. You know, and so we're much more concerned with with them graduating high school than we are with with how they do on the football field. Yeah. And and so, yeah, almost every team is going to provide some sort of tutoring or they're going to have some kind of a program. And a lot of times with these kids, if they just know that coach is looking at their grades, that's enough to kind of kick them in gear a little bit, you know. Mm hmm. Well, it's kind of, it kind of goes all the way to the, like, is you don't see the NFL uh, hiring a lot of people without an education. Like, they're really generally yeah. pulling from colleges. And so, it's like, it's, football and education kind of go hand in hand all the way to the top. Absolutely, yeah. And and one of those things that has always been a good thing about, you know, and, and you can point out bad things about college athletics. It's really easy, okay? Mm-hmm. But one of the good things about college athletics is a whole lot of kids have gone to college who wouldn't have been able to otherwise because they were good athletes, Yeah, you know? And while maybe not every one of those kids took advantage of the opportunities they were afforded, there have been plenty that have. You yeah. know, pl- plenty of guys that maybe maybe they played college football, they never made it to the NFL, but because of the education that they got when they were in college, they're, they're engineers or they're, you know, doctors or lawyers or whatever today. And they never probably would have had the opportunity to go to school if it hadn't been for, for athletics of some kind. Yeah. And so that's the good thing, okay? And I don't want you to get the idea that, it, that that's true of every kid that plays you know, plays athletics in college. There are plenty of them that came from money and they would have, they would have been able to go to school anyway. Yeah. But there are also a lot of those kids that come from, you know, from, from 
from economically depressed areas of the country, from inner cities, from a lot of places like that, that, you know, their lives would have been a struggle. They would have struggled to make something of themselves if they hadn't been able to use athletics to get themselves out of that situation, you know? Yeah. And so that, that to me is one of the great things about college sports. And, and there's, you can point out plenty of bad things about college sports, you know, but one of the great things is the fact that it has given some kids chances that otherwise would have never had a chance. Yeah. And that's, you know, one of the things that even high school athletics that I love about it, you know, I mean, it's the kids learn skills in high school athletics, no matter what the sport is, they learn skills in high school athletics that they wouldn't have an opportunity to learn other ways. You learn about teamwork. You learn about sacrificing for a common cause. You learn a, a lot of social skills by being on a team, you know, and it's not that there's no other way to learn those in high school. There is, you know, the band kids are learning the same thing being in band. And the debate and forensics kids are learning the same thing being in debate and forensics. And in a small school, you've got kids that do all of those things. You know, they do football, basketball, band, debate, whatever. You know, so there are plenty of ways to develop those skills and to, but athletics is certainly one of those. And another thing too, that so many of our kids today, and, and here I'm, I don't want anybody to take this wrong. I'm not insulting you as parents, okay? But so many of our kids today, because of how protective parents have become, they never face adversity. They never hear, you know, they, they never have to face an impossible situation. They never have to hear the word no, or, or I, I, that sounds terrible. That's not really what I'm saying. But you know what I'm saying? They've never had to come up against something and struggle against it. And, and sports makes them do that, you know? Yeah. And so that's a, a, another great way that it develops character. You know, so many of our kids today too, because again, for the same reason, we get kids, they, they get into junior high and high school and they're playing football. And these kids have, unlike, unlike kids from, you know, 40 years ago or 50 years ago, these kids have, have never broken bones. They've never, you know, cause they, mm -hmm. they haven't, they haven't been outside playing. They've been inside playing video games and, yeah. you know, on the computer and stuff like that. And, you know, just getting a kid to realize that just cause you feel a little pain, you're not going to die is yeah. a valuable life lesson too, you know? Yeah. I, I think one of the good things about it too is uh like you can have people that would never be hanging out together talking to each other in a high school setting but if they're on the football team it's like they they can't I mean they might not be the best of friends but they have to like each other it's almost like family you know like yeah. it's very camaraderie you know like in, in high school sports of all yeah kinds. absolutely yeah you get kids from all kinds of different backgrounds you know depending on the school maybe kids from different racial backgrounds ethnic backgrounds but you also get kids just from different socioeconomic backgrounds and you know educational backgrounds and so on you know yeah you you get a pretty diverse group that all have to work together and that again that's not just in athletics in a, it's in all a, extracurricular activities but mm -hmm. But, you know, yeah, I, I am a huge believer in the power and the value of extracurricular activities, not just sports, but all extracurricular activities. They can do so much for a kid. They can build self-esteem. They can, you know, like I said, build that ability to work as part of a team. They can uh, expose students to, you know, so many other types of, of, of kids, so many different backgrounds and cultures and whatever that, yeah, to me, it's hard to overstate the importance of extracurricular activities. Yeah. <laughs> well, Joey, yeah, there is, there's a little truth to that, Joe. There really is. Um, and that's one of those things that, you know, as high school coaches, we're trying to overcome. It's not, like I said, it's not just parenting, but you get so many kids, they come to high school and they've never faced adversity before. And part of that is that whole give everybody a participation trophy culture. I think that that's starting to go by the wayside in most places, to be honest with you. I think most places are starting to see the value of competition. There is value in competition, guys. Okay. Um, there... <laughs> You need to learn how to be a winner and you need to learn how to be a winner with grace. You also need to learn how to be a loser and yes. to be a loser with grace. Okay. 
And all of those things are things that you should learn from, from extracurricular activities. Okay. Um, you know, I can tell you as somebody who's received a participation trophy before or most improved, like, it's not like you feel good when they're like, Hey, here's this, uh, afterthought, you know, you're just like, yeah, uh, yay me. I mean, yeah. I feel like that's, that's the one place, like you say you have two people from different backgrounds, somebody who comes from a lot of money and somebody comes from nothing. None of that matters on the field. Granted, yeah. one person might have nicer shoes, might have uh, nicer mm -hmm. uh, access to more equipment and training, but at the end of the day, it's talent versus talent on that field. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the other thing is, too, it's just some people – the other thing that we don't talk about, I guess, mm -hmm. is when we, when we talk about different backgrounds, that's what we tend to think of as different socioeconomic backgrounds, different you know ethnic backgrounds, whatever – one of the things that we don't think about too is kids come from different backgrounds in terms of having experienced success in their lives too. Mm -hmm. You know, some kids they get before they get on a team and they've never experienced success really, you know, um, others that's all they've ever experienced, you know, now most of us are somewhere in between, but you know, for either of those kids, for that kid that's never experienced anything but success, experiencing a little defeat is a good thing for them, you know? For that kid that's never experienced success, you know, being on a team and experiencing success in the framework of a team is going to be a great thing for them, you know? Um, I think I said this one other time on the program, but when when I was coaching at Elkhart this last go round and they, we were on such a long losing streak, I think it was 43, 44 games. Okay. The seniors that year, when, when we broke the losing streak, we were out on the field and one of them talked about it being the first game we'd won. And I knew that, you know, as far as the framework of football went, you know, and, and I was like, yeah, I know. Uh, then they told me, no, we mean in anything. And so that senior class, they'd never won a game in any sport at any level, really, <laughs> you know, and just that just shocked me, you know? And so, yeah, the, you know, ex do you think experiencing success was good for those kids? Absolutely. You know, um, now would they have still gone on to lead full and rich lives without it? Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but at the same time, experiencing success for some of those kids was huge, you know? It, and so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of great things about extracurricular activities and about sports and the great things aren't always to be found in winning. You know, I think there is life lessons to be learned in losing just as much as there are in winning. I've done stand-up comedy to a packed house and got z got one laugh. Some girl went, ha! <laughs> and yeah. I walked off stage and went and sat in the room by myself. And, like, I immediately felt like I was just – all I could do is laugh. I was like, that was, you know, I'm going to learn so much from the last 15 minutes of my life, you know, because I'm going to replay it for a billion years, you know, to come. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I feel like, yeah, definitely um, – you don't really know who you are until you, you, you see how you handle. Cause like they said, you know, I think you said it, you know, the, the measure of man is not how, how you measure when things are going well. It's when things are going bad yeah. and stuff. So I, I, yeah, yeah. there's a lot to losing. Yeah. I'm a huge believer in that. That's, that's when you really see the measure of a man is in adversity, how they deal with <laughs> adversity. You know, that's when you'll really show whether you're tough or not yeah. is when you're dealing with adversity. You know, it's easy to be tough when everything's going good, you know? everybody's a tough guy when, when things are going good, but when things get bad, have you got it in you to reach down inside and try to change things, you know? Yeah. And, and a lot of people don't, but a lot of people do. And, and sometimes as a coach, you're surprised by it. You know, you see that in, in kids that you didn't think it was in them, you know? And, 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 and that's true. Unfortunately, it's true both on in a good and a bad way. You yeah. see things in kids that you didn't think were there sometimes in a bad way too. But for the most part, it's good, you know? And, and so, yeah, that's, that's the thing to me. If you can get kids involved in things, that's just such a valuable thing. And I don't care whether it's, you know, band or choir or whatever it is. Get, if kids can get out and get involved, it's going to help them so much in later life. Yeah. Do you feel like kids enjoy school more? Because when I was, I went to school in like the late nineties, 
Mm-hmm. And it seemed like everybody thought school was a bummer. Are the kids still thinking it's a bummer or? <laughs> well, yeah, I, yeah, I don't think that has changed probably. <laughs> um, you know, and here's the thing though, it, everywhere you live, there are going to be a bunch of kids that think that school is great. There's going to be a bunch of kids that think that it's prison and most of the kids are going to fall somewhere in between, you know? Um, it, it, it's all about your perspective. It's also a lot about your family background. You know what I'm saying? If your parents didn't enjoy school, chances are you're not going to enjoy it a whole lot either, you know, and vice versa. If your parents really loved school and really emphasized school, chances are you will as well. Okay. So, so a lot of it's background, but a lot of it is experience too. You know, we have kids that they get in school and they just don't experience success. And success gets to be a habit, but so does not experiencing success. You know, failure gets to be a habit just as quickly, if not more quickly than success does. And so if you get kids in school and, and, you know, here's the thing, we were just, you know, running down the idea of participation trophies and stuff like that. But the truth is they have some value. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because when kids are young, if you can get them to experience success, but it's got to be legitimate success. Okay. If they know everybody in class got the same award that I did, then that doesn't feel nearly as much like success as it does. If the teacher can recognize them for something unique to them. And so as a teacher, especially as an elementary teacher, one of those things that hopefully you're trying to do is number one, recognize success in each of your students, no matter how small the success is. Okay. Number two, try to pick out something that's unique about each of your students and point that out to them so that they know that they're unique individuals and so that they feel some value in being a unique individual, you know? And, and like I said, it sounds like the participation trophy theory, but it's really something completely different because the, the problem with the participation trophy is that everybody's recognized at the same level for the same thing. There's absolutely no individuality to it. What actually teaches you to experience success a little bit is to be recognized for something that is unique or at least marginally unique to you, you know, and as a teacher, that's something we all ought to strive to do. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't know that I, that I live up to that standard as much as I should either, but I do try to recognize all of my students as unique individuals. You know, I, I may not, may not be quite as good at, I, I may not have pointed out the good things about them over the years as much as I should, but I do think that I have always tried to make my students feel like they're individuals and like they're they're worthwhile individuals yeah i don't know you were in my class did i make you feel like a worthwhile individual you did man yeah (laughs) well good (laughs) good (laughs) (laughs) yeah i felt like you were um i don't know you just didn't seem like you expected us uh, expected much out of us you were kind of just like (laughs) you guys be cool i'll be cool we'll get through this (laughs) you know (laughs) <laughs> well, no, I don't think that's quite right. <laughs> oh, I don't mean like, I mean, you guys, I mean, you just didn't like. What I would say is I expected something different out of you, <laughs> maybe than I did some of the other kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just mean like you weren't like, uh, it wasn't necessarily like you had a teaching style or anything. You were kind yeah. of just like, you just, you just kind of taught the class. And mm-hmm. I remember your class being uh, one that you could breathe in. You know, so, and this is yeah. nothing against some of the older teachers, but some of them, you know, ruled with an iron fist yeah. and uh, your class was one that, you know, you could felt, you felt like you could, you could let your hair down a little bit. And uh, yeah, yeah, that, that was cool. Yeah. And what I mean, when I say different things, you're right. I didn't expect you to, you know, to, to write an analysis of a novel. Okay. <laughs> but what I did kind of expect from you is for you to, to, to get enough skills that you could go on and become a productive adult. Yeah. You know, you have different expectations for every student. And that's, that's part of, you know, and now I'm a special education teacher, right? And so when you get to be there, you realize that all that is, is what we call, we we like to use fancy words in education. We call that differentiated instruction. Well, all that really means is that you recognize that each student's an individual and they all have individual needs and individual skills, right? Yeah. That's all that means, you know? And so if you can do that as a teacher, that sure helps a lot. 
I posted a video yesterday and it's hilarious, but it's uh, some lady doing a math problem and she's using the new form that you guys teach in school now. And then some oh, other guy God. uses the old form. So he does uh, the problem and then he makes ramen noodles. He yeah. checks his internet. Uh, um, but I, I posted that and a friend of mine who's my age, she was like, yeah, she's like, but honestly, she's like, cause her kids are my age. She's like, I didn't understand math growing up. And she's like, and now like new math, she's like, I get it, you know? So like, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I think that, that you're right, though. I think that, like, the, the biggest problem with teachers that they have is fig not like figuring out the ones that want to learn and how they need to teach them how to because like, nobody learns yeah. the same, you know? Yeah, exactly. Too many teachers, what, what we do is we teach to our learning style. Mm -hmm. You know, we teach the way that we learned things. Well, you know, as long as you got a bunch of kids that are like you, that'll work, you know? Mm -hmm. But most of us are not going to have a bunch of kids that, that are like us. You know, it's, and this is going to sound terrible. I'm going to piss some people off when I say <laughs> this, but, you know, it's easy to teach AP classes and honors classes, you know, because all those kids, all those kids should want to learn and know how to learn, right? Yeah. It's a lot tougher to teach the applied classes and the basic classes and things like that because you've got kids at all different skill levels and some of them want to learn and some of them don't. And it's just being able to connect with them as individuals mm -hmm. and make them realize that there's some value in some of the stuff you're doing in the classroom, you know? Yeah. It, but you have to work at it a lot more, you know, at, at certain levels. Joey says he learned a lot uh, of important lessons losing in wrestling and now coaching. Yeah. He helps his wrestlers a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. There are, I mean, I hate to say it and most coaches don't like to talk about it, but there are important lessons to be learned in losing just as well as in winning. There mm. really are. As a matter of fact, you probably learn more in losing than you do in winning. It doesn't feel as good, but you probably yeah. learn more, yeah. but you know, yeah, it's, I mean, to me, athletics is really much more about the life lessons it teaches you than the wins and losses. I mean, we all want to win. We all want to, you know, have those successful programs, but shaping good human beings w has always been more important to me as a coach than, than wins and losses and things like that. The relationships that I've had with my players and with my students over the years has always been much more important to me than wins and losses. And I think it is for most coaches, you know, they, what I enjoy about sports is that like, even though Elkhart lost 44 games in a row, it's like, they still showed up to 44 games. Yeah, like, exactly. Like, but, and the thing is, is like most, most of us, even if it's our professional team that we like, we, we start each each season off like this is the year, even though like if we really sat down and we're honest with ourselves, it's probably not going to be our year. I mean, just statistically, yeah. there's there can only be one winner out of all these mm -hmm. teams. But I like that every year, no matter what, everybody starts off with like this is the year, you know, and, and yeah. I think that's everybody needs that, especially in a time now where the world's like feels like it's ending and stuff like, you know, just the NFL opening up and doing their first game, like changed the mental health of America Absolutely. Overnight. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's it. Uh, sports are so important at, at our level to the to the kids and their mental mm -hmm. health. You know, they really are. And so that's why, yeah, kind of like you, you know, I'm just so glad to see that we're, you know, even whether it's normal or not, I'm glad to see that we're just out there playing. We're going to have to live with some cancellations here and there and things like that. But the fact that we're out there playing, I'll guarantee you has helped the frame of mind of a whole lot of students. It's made them better students. It's given them something to, you know, something to get out of bed for, you know, it. And so, yeah, some of them need it from a, a ringing endorsement standpoint. for football. It's like, Hey, you guys want to play football this year? You might die. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Every kid. Yes. <laughs> it's just, I mean, that's, that, you're right, man. Yeah. I mean, it, football's an inherently dangerous game. It really is, you know, but at, at the same time, kind of like with, you know, when we start throwing around the numbers on diseases, it, it's an inherently dangerous game. And yes, there are chances of serious injury and yes, there are chances of death. And, but if you really look at it statistically, there, and in, you know what I'm saying? There's a very small chance Yeah. now chance of injury of some kind, like, you know, if we're talking jam fingers for a few days, yeah, jam fingers, twisted ankles. Hey, the chance of that's about 95%, you know, <laughs> but, but serious injuries, fortunately, the, the chances are still relatively low, yeah. you know, life altering injuries.
they do happen, you know, but, but luckily it's still a relatively low number. You know, you know, I, I, you, know you know, football players, high school football players get hurt, but not to be morbid, but the, the most injury, the most injuries I hear of every year in high school sports sports are uh, cheerleaders. Yeah, I've read read that. They throw them people all over the place, and they, if they if they don't catch them, it's bad news. They're up, not, they're way up there. Yeah, absolutely. I've read that statistic somewhere. I don't know. I mean, I don't know that it's true. You know, you see a lot of statistics, and and sometimes you believe them, and sometimes you don't. You know, uh, is I think it was Mark Twain that said there are three types of lies. There's lies, damn lies, and statistics. You know, <laughs> so statistics are always open to interpretation. But I have seen that stat that you know that cheerleading is is per participant is responsible for more emergency room visits than any other sport. And it may well be true. I don't know. You know, that's mm -hmm. one of those things I'd have to kind of research and look at the source and all that kind of stuff before I wanted to throw it out there a whole lot. But I yeah. have, I have heard that. Yeah. Well, Derek, it's getting late, buddy. Joe it, Davis says 30 years, Washington. Come on, man. <laughs> there we go, Joe. Yeah. Nice Joe. Uh, and then I'd, Seth says he still has pain from football. Yeah. And, and there's lots of people that do, you know, I do too, but, but I'll I think guarantee it's one of those pains that most people aren't, aren't upset about. They're just like, yeah, yeah, it's my football injury. Yeah. I've done a lot worse things to myself outside of football than I did on a football field. I though. have a nacho injury. I'm more worried about than <laughs> I don't want people to know about. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Derek, I probably better get to bed. All right, man. I hate to sound like an old man, but I am an old man. <laughs> hey, guys, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, I know we got a little off topic, but to be honest with you, I think it was probably in a good way. Um, tune in Saturday for uh, the Saturday breakdown. We'll take a look at all the action that happens Friday night. We'll be back with you next week on In the Free Zone with Norm on Wednesday evening. Uh, check out Back Home Media. Check out Back Home Media's Twitch stream. Uh, Derek, why don't you give them that? Uh, yeah, just uh, twitch.tv slash backhomemedia. And Seth, we're serious. We want you to co-host this one of these days. I'm going to yeah. hit you up in the, in the messages. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. Uh, thank you guys for, for being with us. We enjoy having you. We enjoy all the comments. And uh, we'll see you Saturday. See you later. <laughs> well... I don't think it, I thought it, that's different I said what I said and I meant it, or lamented Words given weight without thought in a person The way that I talk and the way that I ought To be able to pause and to say that the fault Can be placed on my arms and this playful assault To disgrace in this arm, pray for the day They could wait for the calm You can't control the storm Only weather it, weather it it's five weeks and five days of rain Sideways or scorched earth Search for death or water left with all the thorns With the